Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lance French. I'm the marketing director for WM Environmental, and I would like to welcome to I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on hazardous waste management. Um, I want to take a, a minute to introduce to you our speakers uh, to everyone, Dr. Heather Frost and Dr. Lori Siegelman from WM Environmental. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. No, I don't have a PhD. That's only Heather. Just make that clear up front. Okay. Go ahead. And I guess I need to make it clear. I don't either. So there you go. So before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, this is an interactive webinar, so you can ask questions and please type them through the chat tab on your GoToWebinar uh, window. Um, we do have a lot of information to go through. So if we don't get to your uh, questions right away, um, still send them through. I'll make sure that Lori or uh, Heather sees them and, and answers them as quickly as possible. Um, we are recording this webinar and it will be available uh, to rewatch later this afternoon along with the slides that Lori and Heather are using. So I will send you a link later this afternoon. So that's enough out of me, Lori. Um, we'll start with you. So uh, take it away. All right. Thanks, Lance. Um, during today's webinar, we just want to give you guys a high-level overview of the rules related to hazardous waste management. Uh, we'll start with a brief introduction to RCRA for the benefit of any listeners that may be new to waste management. Then we'll discuss some applicable regulations, the waste classification process, and why that's such an important first step. Um, then we'll get into a little bit about the generator requirements for management of the hazardous waste. And finally, a summary of the recent regulatory updates that have occurred. So the way we're going to split this up is I am going to um, talk about the first part, just hazardous management in general. And then Heather's going to get on and talk about the recent regulatory updates that have occurred. So I want to start with the history and purpose of RICRA. Um, the Resource and Recovery Act, commonly referred to as RICRA, is the primary law governing the disposal of solid and hazardous waste. So it's not only related to hazardous waste. Um, it was originally passed by Congress in 1976 to combat the growing volume of municipal and industrial waste. Um, the primary goals of that program is to protect human health and protect the environment from the hazards or potential hazards of waste disposal. Um, also, some goals were to conserve energy and natural resources and reduce the total amount of waste that was generated, making sure the waste was managed well. Next slide. So a, a little more about the history and the purpose. Um, to achieve the goals that we just uh, listed, RICRA established a system intended to encourage, and re, uh, encourage recycling and reduction of waste. And then the waste that was generated, if you couldn't reduce it or reuse it or recycle it, um, it developed the system for managing that waste from the first time it's generated until its ultimate dis disposal. And so that, that system has become known as the cradle to grave responsibility. So once yours, always yours. Uh, once you generate it, just because it goes out the door does not mean it's not still your responsibility. Um, RICRA authorization. Next slide, Lance. There you go. Um, so RICRA authorization, what that means is that the RICRA state authorization, it's the rulemaking process where EPA delegates the responsibility for implementing the rules or the RICRA has waste program to the individual states in lieu of the EPA implementing that or enforcing it. There's currently 50 states and territories that have been granted this authority. State programs have to be at least as stringent as the federal requirements, but states have the option to adopt more stringent requirements if they want to. Um, and then the hazardous and solid waste amendments of 1984 significantly changed the way that new RICRA regulations are enforced at the state level. Um, EPA does amend the rules pretty regularly, and therefore the authorized states have to. They're, it's mandatory that they adopt the mandatory amendments. But there are some optional amendments that EPA puts forth where the, the states have a choice whether they want to adopt them or not. So if you're looking at a federal rule change, 
um, for instance, if it's considered an optional amendment, then the states don't necessarily have to adopt it. Um, for instance, in Texas, if Texas chooses not to adopt a rule just because EPA has amended that rule doesn't mean you can automatically go by um, the federal rule when it's changed. You need to wait and check with your state. Um, most of you guys, I suspect, are in Texas. You would need to check with Texas to see have they adopted that rule yet. Um, Texas has amended the hazardous waste rules, its rules, 13 different times, um, and they did show they did choose to adopt the latest RICRA amendments. Um, so these amendments, uh, this is what Heather's going to be talking about a little bit uh, later in the presentation. While RICRA is an approach to manage solid and hazardous waste at facilities that are currently in use, so these active manufacturing, manufacturing facilities or, or whomever is currently in actively generating waste and, and disposing of it, after implementation of the RICRA program, um, Congress and, and the government realized that um, it only was applicable to existing facilities. It only partially addressed all the problems of hazardous waste. So CERCLA, um, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, otherwise known as Superfund, um, was enacted or implemented, and it's focused on the management in remediation of all of the abandoned non-operating sites where you have contamination and um, risks to human health and the environment. This is an important aspect of waste management, an important thing to be aware of, because combined with the cradle-to-grave provisions of RICRA, if your waste ends up being identified at a Superfund site, then you will or can be considered a potentially responsible party and then the Department of Justice and EPA will come to you with their handout looking for some monetary compensation to help clean the site up. Uh, and there's also state level cleanup programs uh, very similarly structured to CERCLA. So um, now that we've got that kind of history and introductory information um, out of the way, the applicable regulations at a federal level uh, that are mainly applicable just to the generators of hazardous waste. Now, there's many more regulations that aren't listed here that would apply to the transporters, to the disposal facilities, uh, and other specialty kind of um, facilities. But ones listed here that are primarily applicable to the generators of hazardous waste, which I'm assuming are the, the majority of the people on the call today. Um, most of the time, the federal regulations are adopted by reference into the state rules with no further requirements, um, but also they can be changed and added to by the state when the state adopts them, um, so long as the state rules are at least as stringent. So in Texas, for instance, then here is a similar list, uh, only that's the state level regulatory citations, again, just for the waste generators. Uh, there are other subchapter subchapters and parts that would be applicable to, like the municipal landfills and the, the dis disposal companies and the transporters, but this list here is specific to waste generators. So you would, as a generator, would want to be familiar with all of these different rules. Um, and in, in Texas, again, the um, applicable to generators of hazardous and also industrial waste. Texas does have more stringent and more broad requirements for generators, um, as you'll see later in the presentation, because we're going to talk a little sp specifically about um, Texas regs. Uh, so the very first step, um, briefly I want to go over the, just the basic steps of hazardous waste management, and this is just a very high level uh, things that we can cover in just a, you know, 45 minutes or so. The, but the basic steps of hazardous waste management as it pertains to generators, the very first step needs to be identifying your waste streams. If you don't know what your waste streams are, then you can't be sure they're being managed properly. Um, and that includes all waste, not just your hazardous waste. So, you know, step one, identify what is all of the different, what are all of the different waste streams that your facility generates. Um, so it brings us to our first question. 
what is a RICRA solid waste. When identifying and evaluating each of your waste streams, you need to understand the term solid waste as it is, it's defined in the regulations because this is going to dictate which waste streams may be exempt from the rules um, and which waste streams will be defined as and regulated as a hazardous waste. Only the waste that meet the definition of solid waste are subject to the RICRA rules. Um, and the term solid waste is very broad. Um, it includes not only traditional non-hazardous solid waste such as garbage, but also hazardous wastes. Um, and the definition of solid waste also includes, um, or the broad definition is any discarded material not specifically excluded by regulation or variance. And it can be a solid, a liquid, or a gaseous. And there's a number of exemptions written into the definition of solid waste. Certain things are considered to be exempt and are not solid waste. Um, and the definition of solid waste, and sometimes you'll see it at, by the acronym DSW, is one of the major revisions recently adopted by TCEQ that Heather is going to talk about shortly. So the next question we need to ask, our, ask ourselves, or the next thing that you need to be familiar with is what is a hazardous waste? What would be defined as a hazardous waste? Once you determine your waste is a solid waste or not, then the next thing to do is determine whether or not it meets the definition of and is regulated as a hazardous waste. And if it is, what is its waste code? Or codes. Any particular hazardous waste has the potential to have more than one hazardous waste code, depending upon what it is. And this, um, this next slide is a chart that kind of visually represents um, the different categories of waste. And you can follow it from the top down and use it uh, as a flow chart as well. Um, for example, if you have a material, we start at the top of the chart, you have a material that you're evaluating whether or not it would be regulated as solid waste. And, and then, is it a hazardous waste? Check all of the exemptions and exclusions contained in the definition of solid waste. For instance, uh, the two the two top blocks above the red line that would not be subject to RICRA. 40 CFR 261.4 contains a list of materials that are specifically excluded, uh, things such as domestic sewage or wastewater discharges that are permitted under the Clean Water Act. Uh, another set of exclusions would be under 40 CFR 261.2, and that particular uh, part or paragraph is, is where the definition of solid waste uh, is contained. It contains the broad definition plus a list of materials that would be excluded under certain circumstances. Um, for instance, paragraph E contains a list of materials that would not be considered a solid waste when they're recycled. So if you determine that your waste is indeed regulated as a solid waste, none of the exemptions or exclusions apply, then the next step would be to determine if maybe it's exempt or excluded from being regulated as a hazardous waste. So hazardous waste being a subset of solid waste, if your waste isn't a solid waste, then it can't be regulated as a hazardous waste. So a lot of generators want to want to get those exclusions for solid waste, um, and if it's excluded for solid waste, you're, you're pretty much done, and you don't have to go any further to figure out if it's hazardous or not hazardous. Hey, Lori, I have a question uh, from somebody really quick. Um, how concept of green and safe chemicals can be incorporated in the new laws and regulations? In the new laws and regulations, so that would be like the, I'm not sure, new laws and regulations, what that what that means. Okay, I'll tell you, um, we'll make sure that you see this one later and we can, uh, I can get clarification. And uh, Do these rules and regulations, um, are they designed by looking at cradle to, cradle to cradle or circular economic models? I really don't understand that question. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll get more clarification on this later. Yeah, economic? Yeah, I did, I did horrible in economics, so um, no, I'm kidding. I, I'm not sure I understand um, the details of either of those questions. I think that maybe would require a little bit more of a conversation. But the first one uh, related to green chemicals and chemistry, 
um, as it relates to the new regulations. If, if by referencing the new regulations, um, they mean the changes that have just been adopted, the changes that were adopted mainly relate to the definition of solid waste, which does try to incorporate more of a clarification and a little more um, leniency, I guess, for recycling and reclamation of your waste. So that, and it also provides some clarification and regulations meant to prevent or eliminate sham recycling. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what the person asking the question is, uh, is meaning or not. But uh, I know there's some other things related to solvent remanufacturing that may apply as well. So when you're talking about um, but green, green chemistry and maybe doing some type of screening or new chemical evaluation before you choose your chemicals um, is, is a little bit different. Um, but we can, we can visit with those questions later after the presentation, so I make sure I do address what the, what the people are asking. Um, is, that, is that it for now, Lance, as far as questions? Uh, yeah, that's, what I'm going to do is I'll just email them and we'll get more clarification and then um, I'll show awesome. them to you. Okay, cool. Um, so then we get to, to Texas. Now, so we, Texas follows the same rules for solid and hazardous waste. Um, as far as classification and what is a solid waste and what is a hazardous waste. But then they go one step further by requiring generators to evaluate the non-hazardous wastes into either class one, class two, or class three categories based on the toxicity and some other, other things. So this is specific to industrial waste generators. So that's yet another term to become familiar with what is an industrial generator. Uh, whether or not you are an industrial waste generator or not. Um, and for instance, if you're a retail store, then you wouldn't be considered an industrial generator, yet you may generate the same type of waste that a manufacturing facility down the street generates. Well, you're, you as a retail store would not fall into regulation under um, this particular rule that requires you to, to categorize your non-hazardous waste. So there's a little nuances there for um, Texas generators related to non-hazardous waste. Um, so when you're identifying your way, all of your waste streams, um, the, a common gap that I see among generators and, and a lot of our clients, and one of the most commonly cited violations that I've seen TCQ and also at the federal level, is that not all of the waste streams have been identified. There's a lot of waste streams that are forgotten, not addressed by the generator as far as proper waste classification or, or documenting that. Often the only wastes that are considered are the ones associated with directly with the manufacturing process. But there's many other typical wastes that need to be considered, such as your used oil, your waste paint, um, even in, in maintenance, um, I see this a lot, all of the waste paint and waste maintenance type of chemicals and um, brake cleaners and solvents and things used there, waste absorbents, batteries, floor sweeping. Um, there's a lot of different things to consider. So um, it's very important to look across all of your different departments, not just focus on your, your manufacturing processes. So in summary, um, the steps, again, going from left to right here, high-level summary of the requirements for managing your wastes. Uh, and this applies to pretty much all generators, even those that are conditionally exempt. Um, and we'll get into what is conditionally exempt in just a second. Um, first, identify all your wastes, which that's what we've been talking about. Determine which ones, if any of them, are regulated as hazardous. Um, or non-hazardous industrial wastes, if you happen to be in Texas, classify those accordingly. Then after you've done all that, you're required to, you need to store them properly. You don't want them spilled all over the place or mishandled. Um, keep documentation of your waste processes, especially if you've determined some of them are exempt or excluded. Train your employees, any reporting that's required, such as annual or biennial reporting and then emergency response procedures. And now not all of that list 
would be applicable by regulation to conditionally exempt small quantity generators, for instance, but it's still a, a really good idea to do um, or a best practice to do all of these things, even if it's not required by regulation. So getting into just a little more detail um, on some of these items we've been talking about, probably the most important thing you can do is com complete a documentation package for each of the waste streams that you identified. Um, you want documentation that details whether or not it's a solid waste, um, and if it is a solid waste, is it a hazardous waste? Um, if it's a non-hazardous waste and you're in Texas, you want to document what class what class? Is it class one, class two, class three? Include in your documentation and in your rationale for the waste determination any process flow charts, safety data sheets, analytical data, regulatory citations. Say you've decided it's exempt because you recycle it. You want to cite that regulatory citation and um, you know write down and file memo to file or something um, that we recycle it, we do this with it, and here's the regulatory citation that says it's not regulated as a solid waste or it's excluded from definition of hazardous waste or whatever the case may be. Um, also, that's very useful information to share with your waste hauler or your vendor so they can properly profile your waste for disposal. If you're a, and I see this over and over, if you're a conditionally exempt small quantity generator and you're not paying much attention to your vendor, you just say, here, haul it off. More often than not, they're going to overclassify that waste stream. If it's questionable whether it's hazardous or non-hazardous, they're going to profile it as hazardous. Um, and if it's non-hazardous and that's pretty clear cut, then they're going to make it a class one hazardous waste. And if you haven't gone to the trouble to, to catch that and talk to them about it and, and properly classify it, you could find yourself in the position of, of shipping off-site class one waste that really wasn't class one, possibly, and then you get pulled into more regulations under, under the state of Texas than you need to be uh, because now you're a class one generator if you pass a certain threshold. Um, it kind of throws you into some reporting requirements you wouldn't necessarily have to, have to be in if you had gone to the trouble to communicate with your vendor the appropriate information. Next slide, Lance. Sure, well, did you want to um, launch the poll or is that the next slide? Oh, yeah, if there's a poll. I forgot about that. Sure, please. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so let me give, give them a few more minutes to. Okay, I'll go ahead and close the poll right now. Lori, can you see the results? No. Okay, so it says, um, so the question was, how many, have, uh, how many of you have documented on file for every waste stream that you generate? And 76% said yes, and 24% said no. Ah, okay. Well, 76% that said yes is, is surprising because I, I would, my experience with the clients that we have, um, and just in general, just general industry, it's more 50-50 or even less. But that's good then. That, that means the participants um, on our call are managing their waste very well. We have a sharp um, crowd. The majority. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Um, so moving on to the to the next slide, then once you make all of your waste determinations, then you know which rules need to be followed. So that that's very important, figuring out what's hazardous, what's not, what's excluded, what's not. Document the heck out of that. Um, but then you know what your generator status 
that combined with some more information will help you determine your generator status. So generator status um, is dictated by how much hazardous waste is generated each month, not by how much is shipped on a manifest during a single month, but in dur during one month how much is actually generated. So you want to count the waste that's generated in your satellite accumulation areas um, and also um, at other manufacturing points and in your in your storage areas. Um, then your generator status is then going to dictate how long you're allowed to store your waste on site and other requirements such as level of training you have to uh, train your employees to the details of your emergency planning, um, among other things. So the first step was to identify your waste streams and classify those or make waste determination. Then step two, watch your generator status. Um, step three, then manage it appropriately while while it's on site. Um, Gloria, I do have next. A, oh, sorry. I do have a, yeah. uh, two more questions. Um, are recycled materials not considered solid waste? And if so, do we not need to fill out the RG022 forms for those materials? Um, recycled materials uh, may or may not be considered solid waste. And you would need to look at the specific exclusions in the solid waste rule, depending on what the material is, um, whether it's like a spent solvent or a sludge specifically in the rules that you're recycling, and then depending on how exactly you're recycling it, um, it could be a solid waste but exempt from hazardous waste, um, or it could be excluded from solid waste altogether. So there's many, there, there's quite a few different um, exclusions and exemptions that you would have to read through to make that determination. But just because you recycle it doesn't automatically mean it's um, not a solid waste. You have to find the specific exclusion. Um, and now whether or not you'd have to fill out the RGO 22, I believe is that the checklist in the, in the TCEQ guidance document um, that helps you determine or make that documentation. I, I think that's what that is. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember the reg guide number. Um, but just documentation in general, if you're looking at a waste stream and you're deciding, oh, we're recycling it, therefore it's excluded from uh, being regulated as a solid waste, um, and here's why. I would go ahead and document that. Whether or not you fill out a specific checklist or not, um, I don't think would be necessary to do a checklist per se, um, but at least some kind of document that says that that contains that rationale. And if you are recycling it, then maybe some information about where you're recycling it and some documentation that it was shipped to a certain person or a certain company for recycling. And if they provide any certificates of um, certificates of recycling, it would be helpful to keep that as well. OK, and the, uh, one more question is, um, so she, it looks like she's asking the question on something you said earlier. She was, but what is the proper, and she had proper in all caps, What's the proper way to document our waste streams? Um, the proper way to document a waste stream, uh, there are very specific requirements that are called out in the TCEQ regulations, um, specific pieces of information that you're supposed to document. Um, they have uh, the checklist within their regulatory guide that will help you document those specific pieces of information. But the proper way to, would be to either to use that checklist and combine that checklist with any other data you're using to fill in the checklist. So for instance, um, in that checklist, and you don't have to use the checklist, um, but you can. It's a, good, it's a good guide. But for instance, one of the decisions you're going to make is, you know, is it a hazardous waste? Well, is it a characteristic hazardous waste? Um, from a toxicity standpoint, is it below all of these different levels for chromium, for lead, for um, cadmium, and, and on and on? If you have analytical results that prove that, yes, it's below those limits, then attach the analytical results um, to the checklist or to the other memo to file or whatever you're filling out that has the information. So that would be the, pro the proper way for me is you either fill out a checklist or you fill out some kind of memo to file or a form um, with the specific pieces of information that TCEQ requires, at least, 
and then supplement that with any data that you use to answer those questions um, or to make that determination, be it safety data sheet, um, if you're using any type of process knowledge, maybe a process flowchart or a narrative of the process, um, you know, anything that you use to make that determination, I would append to the checklist or the memo and then put that in the file. Very good, thank you. Okay. Um, these next few slides are just a, a summary table, and I think this table originally came out of one of the EPA guidance documents or, um, or, training, or training documents. Um, it's just a comparison of the different generator statuses. You're either conditionally exempt small quantity generator, small quantity generator, or large quantity generator. And as your generator status increases, so the amount of the waste, hazardous waste, that you're generating increases beyond these thresholds, then the amount of uh, regulatory requirements uh, increases or the, the stringency that you have to manage that waste increases. Um, there are not many restrictions for, for the conditionally exempt generators, such as the time limit, but there is a maximum quantity that can be stored on site. Um, that's another thing I see quite often is people, companies, um, assume that they're conditionally exempt, therefore there's really no requirements. So they're not really training their folks, um, they're not paying attention to how much waste they have in storage, they're not documenting their generation rate, like how much they generated per month, and so, so really they're out of compliance with a lot of the different rules because they can't prove anything. Um, so getting to the next slide then, um, again, conditionally exempt, small quantity generators. They don't have any specific storage requirements. Um, the best practices to limit liability would be to go ahead and manage um, the waste appropriately and to fill out a manifest. Uh, as far as reporting requirements, again, not much required for conditional exempt. As far as reporting, training, um, emergency planning, um, small quantity generator, everything's required, but kind of at a at a lower level than large quantity generator, you need a full-blown contingency plan, a full-blown emergency procedures, um, biannual reporting. Now in Texas, they have annual reporting, which fulfills the biannual report requirement. Um, and then the, the last thing, the DOT rules, they're a little different as they apply across the board to all the generators equally. Hazardous waste is considered and defined as a dangerous good under the DOT rules, and so when you're transporting dangerous goods, it has to be done so in accordance with the DOT rules and specific training for shipping this waste is required. So if you're signing manifests or helping prepare those shipments and labeling drums and things like that, then there are DOT training requirements um, that you have to meet, even if you're a conditionally exempt small quantity generator. And then finally, um, as a final thought, proper waste management, and this is another especially important thing to do, in addition to documenting your waste identification or your waste determination process, is to track your monthly waste generation rate so that you can demonstrate your generator status. This is especially important for the small and the conditionally exempt uh, small quantity generators, not so much important for a large quantity generator. Um, for large quantity generators, unless you're doing some waste minimization and pollution prevention where you want to track your waste generation, um, it's really not, not that big of a deal. But for conditionally exempt and small quantity, you really need to have a handle on what your monthly generation rate is and be able to, to demonstrate that. Whether it's a log sheet, um, like what's shown on the screen, or from process information, you can demonstrate that Gee, on a daily basis, the most of this waste stream we could generate is, is X pounds. And if we're operating, you know, 20 to 30 days a week, then here's as much as we can generate. We can't generate any more. You wouldn't necessarily need to log it on a log sheet like this, but at least you have that information, you've thought it through, and you know what your generator status is and can demonstrate that. Lori, um, we have a question. Uh, where, can we, where can we get copies of the tracking charts and the checklists you've mentioned? 
Um, these are charts and checklists that we've developed for our clients over the years, and it's like a continual effort. They change as, as we see changes and revisions are needed, but you know we're happy to provide that to anybody who is is interested in having it. They just email me and let me know, and I'll have happily email that to them. Great, thank you. Okay, um, we're going to take just a like a fifteen second break here, and I'm going to let um, Heather Frost take over. She is the division manager for industrial compliance with our group and she's going to talk to you guys about the recent um, rule adoptions and some other proposed rules that are still out there at the federal level. So hang on one second. I feel like we I feel like we should have music in this in this break. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the transition there, but uh, my name is Heather Frost, and I will now be discussing some of the revised federal and state rules. So this is just kind of a transition slide of what we're going to talk about today. But there have been numerous changes recently um, to the definition of solid waste, and these rules collectively represent the most significant changes to the regulations since 1985. So these rules are important to you as a waste generator because the, the new and proposed rules affect the waste classification process. So in some cases we've seen the new regulations are a little more lenient, but in other cases we've seen that these regulations go in a direction that we have not seen um, in quite a while with RECRA, and that is that they've become a little more stringent. So Lori spoke briefly about RECRA authorization. Uh, because states are authorized to implement the RECRA program, implementation of these new regulations and proposed regulations might vary amongst the states. So we'll discuss a few of the regulations, but uh, keep in mind that it's important to evalu evaluate the regulations in your own state. So a few of the specific uh, new rules and proposed changes that we'll introduce today are the e-manifest final rule, and that was published in 2014, which authorizes the use of electronic hazardous waste manifests, and we'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about that in a minute. We also have the solvent containing wipes rules that have been authorized in some states. Uh, the cathode ray tube regulations that um, impact export and export tracking of CRTs. Uh, we'll talk about the steel slag rules, and that's, uh, that's specific to the state of Texas. And then get into the most significant change, and that's the changes in the definition of solid waste, DSW, or the definition um, now includes hazardous secondary materials, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then um, proposed pharmaceutical role, rules that are just built on the rules that were proposed in 2008. And then talk a little bit about some proposed changes as well. So first, the e-manifest rule. This um, gives generators the option to complete, sign, transmit, and store their manifest information electronically. This would extend to all federally and state regulated ways that currently require manifests, and the EPA is authorized to collect user fees for this program. So the effective date was this summer, June of this summer, and currently a fee schedule um, is being evaluated and in the near future, a system will be online. But right now, we don't have that system. Right now, we just have the rule authorizing the use of these manifests once the program has been established. Uh, 
the solvent containing wipes rule became effective federally in January of 2014. However, the solvent containing wipes rules are less stringent than the previous requirements under RECRA. Therefore, the EPA has indicated that the solvent containing wipes rule was optional for states with authorized RECRA programs. So each state must determine whether or not they would like to adopt this final rule or certain provisions of the rule into the regulations. The TCEQ did adopt this rule in January of 2015. So this rule uh, excludes wipes that are contaminated with solvents from certain hazardous waste requirements. The rule also modifies regulations for solvent containing wipes, solvent contaminated wipes that are cleaned and reused and those that are sent for disposal. The purpose of the rule was to provide a regulatory framework for these wipes that's appropriate not only um, to the level of risk in a way that maintains protect protection of human health but in the environment, but also reduces compliance cost for So the new rule accomplishes that goal by, um, by allowing manifest to be a disposed of without a manifest when they're sent off-site. They can also be sent to non-hazardous waste handling facilities. Okay. Uh, to be eligible for the conditional exemption, both the reusable and the disposable wipes have to be managed in accordance with some rules. And those rules are that all solvent con contaminated wipes must be kept in non-leaking closed containers. Those containers must be labeled excluded solvent contaminated wipes. The wipes cannot be accumulated longer than 180 days, and the accumulation start date has to be marked on the container to verify that. And at the point of transport, the wipes may not contain free liquids. So generators must maintain documentation that they're managing the wipes in accordance with these regulations. The CRT rule um, became effective December 26th of 2014, and this revised export provisions of the 2006 rule. It provides for better tracking of CRTs that are exported for reuse and also recycling. So the rule only affects export provisions of the CRT rules. It does not affect any regulations that are applicable to the domestic management of these materials. This rule does have five main parts. Um, they've defined CRT exporter. They've now required annual reports from exporters, um, revised notification um, um, when these materials are sent for recycling, also revised notification when they're exported for reuse, and normal business records are maintained by the exporters and that those can be translated into English upon request. The next slide here is the steel slag rule, and this is specific to generators in the state of Texas. This uh, new rule, or this new exclusion from regulation as a solid waste, has been codified in the Texas Health and Safety Code. It prevents the commission from regulating steel slag as a solid waste. If the steel slag has not been discarded, it is not intended for output um, of or the result of the use of an electric arc furnace to make steel. So this material is exempt from regulation if the solid waste is not discarded, if it's introduced into the stream of commerce, and it's managed as an item of commercial value. The, the most major element of these new regulations is the new definition of solid waste. So we now have a formal definition of solid waste and hazardous secondary material that will promote recycling while still being protective of human health and the environment. The centerpiece of this new rule um, is three new exclusions from the definition of a solid waste that apply specifically to hazardous secondary materials. 
and these are defined as listed byproducts, listed sludges, and spent materials that are all recycled by being reclaimed. These exclusions are referred to specifically as the generator controlled exclusion. Can you go to the next slide, Lance? Sorry. I think we've skipped ahead a little bit. Okay, the generator ex controlled exclusion, the verified recycler exclusion, and the remanufacturing exclusion. I think you need to go ahead. Yeah, I think you were on the slide, and then we went back. One more. There you go. The generator controlled exclusion applies to hazardous secondary materials that are generated and legitimately reclaimed by the generator of the material. The verified recycler exclusion was formally referred to as transfer-based exclusions. And to take advantage of these exclusions, the generator must satisfy very specific criteria, which is to notify uh, the executive director of your recycling activity to ensure that the hazardous secondary materials are properly contained to prevent release, the criteria for evaluating the legitimacy of the recycling operation is now evaluated. We have specific record keeping requirements. We have to avoid speculative accumulation. And the facility that does the reclamation must have either a RECRA permit or a solid waste variance. And all persons managing that hazardous second material must maintain proper financial assurance. The third major element there is the remanufacturing exclusion, and that allows for the transfer of certain spent solvents from one manufacturer to another for remanufacturing, which is defined as extending the useful life of the original solvent. So the secondary material in this case must be one of 18 specified solvents, and the goal of this particular exclusion is to keep materials in commerce, so it does not apply to solvents that have been sent to commercial recyclers. Heather, uh, we have a question here uh, real quick. The steel slag exemption, does that apply to slag that is reused as road base or incorporated into material that will be applied to the land? Uh, the steel slag rule, I'd have to look more into that, but I have seen some information indicating that that would be applicable. Okay, major elements of the new definition of solid waste. This broadens the exclusions from the definition of solid waste for materials such as spent materials, so spent solvents, spent acids. Um, listed sludges, and this is very important. I know that um, many waste generators in the metals industry have looked forward to this uh, being included. We also have listed byproducts, spent petroleum catalysts, another one that's very important to the metals industry, and metals um, that are part of listed sludges, so uh, metals that have been in smelting, melting, refining furnaces as well. And um, regarding the verified recycler exclusion and the requirements to maintain financial assurance, are FA estimates required to be submitted to the state? So that um, those documents are required for facilities that are managing that material. So I know part of a RECRA Part B permit is that you hold financial assurance. and. Uh, when you do hold the RECRA Part B permit, that's an annual requirement you have to submit that documentation to the state. So major um, elements of the new definition. Um, we have four factors that now have been codified for determining if the hazardous secondary materials were being legitimately recycled. So this 2015 rule expands on the application of this criteria and now applies this to all recycling. So this means that the legitimate recycling provision applies to all hazardous secondary mat materials that are excluded or exempted from RECRA, which are the materials we're talking about now, but also 
this legitimacy provision applies to all recyclable hazardous waste that remain subject to partial or total hazardous waste regulation. So this would include, when we're talking partial hazardous waste regulation, that would include things such as the precious metals. Okay. Now we can move on a little bit to the hazardous waste pharmaceuticals. This is a proposed rule. It's a set of regulations for the management of hazardous waste pharmaceuticals by healthcare facilities and reverse distributors. It will provide standards to ensure the management of hazardous waste pharmaceuticals is safe and also workable in the healthcare setting. So we have seen some of the hazardous waste rules aren't really practical in these um, healthcare settings, so hopefully this will um, make things a little bit more manageable. This proposed rule is built on the 2008 EPA proposal to add pharmaceuticals to the uh, types of hazardous waste that could be managed as universal waste. Uh, that a lot of commenters supported the idea of those new regulations, but there were numerous concerns over the lack of notification requirements, the lack of tracking requirements for shipping of those wastes and other things. Uh, therefore, the agency decided not to finalize that 2008 proposed rule, but rather develop another proposal for new standards for the management and disposal of these wastes. So now we see in 2016, we have this new proposed rulemaking that will pro pertain to those pharmaceutical wastes that meet the current definition of a recrohazardous waste that are generated by these healthcare-related facilities. In this new proposed rule, we do not have um, a provision for flushing of pharmaceuticals. Um, this proposed rule would ban all sewering of pharmaceuticals. So um, we also have some proposed hazardous waste generator rules that we're looking, uh, that we're evaluating for the fall of 2016. We're expecting that there will be an overhaul of the rules, some becoming more stringent, some less stringent. Some of the things that we're looking at becoming more stringent are the hazardous waste determinations, the labeling requirements. The less stringent parts of these rules would be episodic generation for one, the waiver of the 50-foot rule, and some of the satellite accumulation rules. On the next slide, we can talk more specifically about a few of these proposed rule examples. Um, so one of the big things here, some companies would like to be able to consolidate their waste from several conditionally exempt small quantity generator sites for more efficient shipping and hazardous waste management. So what they're looking at is consolidation um, at a large quantity generator under the control of a single person. Currently, uh, RECRA also, the rules lack flexibility to address an episodic change in the generator's regulatory category. It's very difficult to manage episodic waste generation under the current rules. The, um, the proposed changes would allow generators to maintain their existing category, provided that they comply with a streamlined set of requirements. So once a calendar year, um, they would allow an episodic generation of waste without jumping into a higher category. You would also have the ability to petition for a second annual event. And this is important to generators that have tank cleanouts or, or activities such as that. So in, to summarize, I think some of the things that Lori talked about earlier and that I talked about, it's important to know what is your waste. Um, and some of these new regulations play into that as well. You really have to understand and be able to classify your waste streams and based on that determine how much you generate and what your generator status is. After you do that, you can properly manage those wastes. So keep in mind that you need to be aware of your excluded materials, special wastes, your universal wastes, and of course your hazardous and um, your non-hazardous wastes. 
And as Lori stressed, it's very important to document, 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 and have these waste classification forms. So if you are managing waste under an exclusion or an exemption, that is still documented in your waste classification. And always think about that long-term liability and the cradle-to-grave management of those materials. Okay. So if anybody has any questions um, that uh, we covered, uh, go ahead and send them in now. And if not, we're kind of coming to the close of our time. Um, if you don't, if you have a question and that you didn't want to get um, added onto the webinar, you can always email us and we can um, absolutely uh, get those answered for you. So as of right now, sure. I don't have Lori any. And I would, yeah, Lori and I would be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have by email. So it's an exciting time in RECRA regulation right now, a lot of changes. So it's nice to be able to talk through some of these changes with people and make sure that you're managing the waste appropriately. Okay. And here's our contact. Here's uh, Lori and Heather's contact information uh, for you guys. Um, if you um, do want to send in your questions and or if you are looking for some of those charts um, or forms um, that Lori uh, was talking about earlier. So um, I just wanted to bring up um, the next uh, event that we are going to be having. It's, it's the actual hazardous waste management training. Uh, we're having one in Dallas and Houston uh, next month. And um, Lori and Heather, can you tell, give us um, what the importance of this training, this is an eight hour training, of course we went through a webinar, what's the importance of the eight hour training compared to, to this? Well, what we did today was more an introduction to some of the regulations and um, not really a training course. But when we offer the training, we really get into how to identify your waste how to classify those wastes, what tests do you need to run, how to document those materials. You'll get some examples of some of these tracking spreadsheets that we've created. Um, you'll be trained on um, managing that waste container, labeling um, how to store the waste, satellite accumulation. It's just much more in depth than what we went through today. And it's important to keep in mind that as a waste generator or someone that signs manifest to ship hazardous waste, you have a training requirement. So um, you need to check and make sure that you, you keep up to date on your RECRA training as well as your DOT training to be able to sign those documents. Excellent. And um, we do have a, um, a price uh, reduction on these classes. Um, if you sign up before September, um, August 16th, um, which is, or I'm sorry, yeah, August 16th, um, or that is, I need to look at my calendar. By the 19th, you said by the 19th, there's a $100 deduction on there, and we are going to be um, including a, a special registration gift as well. So, um, and if you have any, uh, you can get, uh, you can um, register on, at our website on the events page. And then also here's some, some other upcoming events. Um, in San Antonio, we're having a, a stormwater qualified personnel training um, in da uh, San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston um, on the 20th, 22nd, and the, the 27th. And then our next webinar is on the 22nd, is on the SPCC plans, the five-year updates. And you can also register um, online at our, on our events page or contact me, uh, Lance Fr L. French at wh-m.com, and I can help uh, with any questions you have. Um, and just a reminder, I'm going to uh, be uh, sending the recording out uh, probably later this afternoon, so I will send everybody an email with the link, and um, it will also include the slides that we use today. So, Heather and Lori, thank you so much for your time today, and um, I just appreciate it, and then um, thank you for uh, giving us this great information. Thank you. Have a great day, guys.